Well, good morning, everybody. This is Sridhar Ramanathan, co-founder of Aventi Group. I'm super excited to be here with my colleague, Steve Cross. And I'll, I'll introduce you in just one sec, Steve. Today, we're going to talk about what really works in the channel. What really works? We as marketers, we do a lot of stuff, but what really works? So I have the privilege today of asking an expert, Steve Cross, who um, has a tremendous background in channel sales. He took Connectix, the company literally from zero to $100 million dollars through channel sales. He also more recently worked at Atlassian for a number of years, and he was honored by the president of Atlassian. He was given the Lifetime Achievement Award. If you don't know, Atlassian is virtually 100% channel organization. They're the darling of SaaS companies and software companies. And Steve's role, he was masterful of driving real revenue. We can't say how many hundreds of millions, but he drove a lot of revenue in Atlassian. So Steve, welcome, thanks for joining. And everyone in the audience, Ask questions anytime. This is a conversation. So use the chat field and ask your questions. We want to hear them. Uh, welcome, Steve. Thank you so much for coming. It's great to see you. Oh, Sridhar, thank you for the kind introduction. Uh, much appreciated. And uh, thanks for the invitation. I, I'm just so looking forward to this. Absolutely. So yeah, just so uh, I'm going to have you launch in here, Steve, and telling us what really works in the channel. I want to define channel because channel, there's a lot of different kinds of channel partners. You could have a global system integrator, you could have a value added reseller, you could have a solution provider and now managed services. All of those are forms of channel partnerships, distributors. You know, Steve, let's, um, I'd love to hear, so what really works? What is it that's driving actual revenue? Just, you know, your main advice. Well, I I think one has to keep in mind how your partners actually make money, how they make a living. I think that's really the most important thing. Uh, and I think there are a lot of assumptions made. And I also believe that there's a dissonance between the uh, worldview on the sales side and the marketing side. Yeah, let's talk about that. Well, first, I want to double click on your comment about how they make money. So what are some of the income streams when you think about your channel partners and all the experience you've had? How do they make money? Um, great question. Thanks, Sridhar. Uh, the, the, how they make money. It generally is about three or four revenue streams. The first one is uh, sales of hardware or software or both. The second is uh, consulting services, right? Uh, installation, integration, uh, migration services, those types of things. Third one is training. And uh, aside from that, uh, th those are really the main sources. And, and it's important, I believe, to understand for your channel partners, whether they are uh, value-added dealers, value-added resellers, solution partners, no matter what they are, distributors, it's important to understand what their mix is, how they make a living, what their margins are. There we go. Yeah, yeah, I hear you. You know, I heard a rule of thumb there, Steve, uh, three to one, four to one leverage of services to software sales. So if you're a value add resource, you probably sell a lot of training and integration services, professional services, support, all that stuff adds up to three to four times the actual software hardware. Um, I'm just curious, is there any multiple rule of thumb that you hear about with regards to how these partners make money off of the vendors that are providing technology, let's say? I think it's variable. I think some partners come to depend on one revenue stream more than another. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that's unfortunate. They need a balance, but they have to determine their own business plan and their own business model, how they uh, choose to make a living. Mm -hmm. Now let's go back to that second point, Steve, you made about dissonance. I, it's such a great word. What is the dissonance we're talking about here you see all the time between the marketing side of the house and the actual sales side? Yeah, the sales side is focused on uh, the components of a, uh, of a channel program are uh, a, a defined relationship, uh, lead generation, and on the marketing side, the uh, uh, components of a successful partnership are certifications, training, uh, which are all things that, I mean, those are the top two that marketers generally come up with. And those two are things that cost the partner money. Okay, let's, so let's talk about that. So that, that's the distance you're talking about marketing. We're thinking about lead gen, marketing development funds. We're thinking about certifications. 
channel sales side of the house probably cares a lot about margin and penetrating new opportunities, expanding current accounts. But you talked about the cost. What is it that we as channel marketers often underestimate and maybe throw out some real numbers? Like what, what does it really cost to yep. implement a program? Great question. Uh, so let's just say, well, first of all, there's a straight line division in your partners between W-2 employees and 1099 employees that materially affects what the um, impact to their top line is, right? Because let's say they're charging uh, the customer $300 an hour and for consulting services, and they uh, the, 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 the partner is charging that right. to the customer. And uh, so they're paying a hundred and a half, 200, uh, an hour to the consultant. And if it's a W-2 consultant, they're actually, it's burdened by 1.6 usually or something like that. And uh, so there, that's $320 an hour. Right. Well, that's the impact to their top line, $320 an hour. And if, if the marketing team proposes a new training that takes six hours, and if your partners are mostly W-2 people, Good gosh, that's uh, 320 times six, $1,920 per, per right. consultant. Let's say they've got 100 consultants. That's a ton of dough. That's real money off their top line. And they have to figure out how to compensate for that. So it, it, it materially impacts their uh, top line. Yeah, that's really a great point that we don't often think about is the cost to the partner. So just those numbers you mentioned. So if you have three hundred dollars per hour billable, right, times a six hour training, that's eighteen hundred dollars, you know, times a hundred people, that's you know, if I got my math right, one hundred eighty thousand dollars, if that's correct. Unbelievable. It's a ton of money. It is a ton of money, and that's top line impact. And I don't think I don't uh I don't want to make a, a blanket. I don't want to cast any dispersions on people. I don't want to make a blanket indictment of everyone on the marketing side. That's really unfair and not true. But um, but I believe that it, it would it would be advantageous, and I believe incumbent upon marketers to think more about that um, issue. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, for sure. And, and we have a number of clients that are technology firms that absolutely rely on channel partners. And one of the things we advise is don't do six hour big, long training sessions. Can you break it down into bite sized chunks? So, for example, <clears throat> excuse me, can you just do like a 45 minute on demand training uh, on demand, which means the rep only takes like 10 minutes, 15 minutes to complete one module and they can come back to it later and do another 10 minutes. And there are little quizzes that pop up that ask them certain questions. I know, Steve, this falls in the category of certification, but it is training that is important for that rep to be effective. I am curious your thoughts around the sort of monolithic big training events versus, say, on-demand, self-paced learning, uh, those kind of things. Any uh, In your experience at Atlassian, what do you see out there in the ecosystem? Um, well, Atlassian is fully modularized. And so they can take small bites. The uh, partners are allowed to, uh, are able to, and enabled to take small bites. I think that's the only way to do it. As you talked about, what you recommend to your clients, that's absolutely, I mean, that should be the gold standard in, in how uh, trainings are delivered uh, in, in small bites so that um, the consultants at, at the partners and, and their sales reps and all their people can take small bites of this training. Uh, and as it fits into their um, activities. Right. And when I come back uh, with regards to training, that is actually a cost to the partner, to the channel partner, sales uh, rep, the seller, because, you know, Steve, talk a little bit about the options. If you're a channel sales representative, sales seller, you have multiple vendors that you're able to sell. So you're probably going to take the path of least resistance. If one vendor, let's suppose you have eight to 10 you know, one of them says you got to do the six hour training. Another one says, no, nope, just do it on demand as you can on the fly. Yeah, I'd love your thoughts around what, what is it like to be in the shoes of a channel seller? And when you're presented with vendor programs, how does that come across? Super. Um, it's so interesting because uh, for a lot of um, channel, channel sales managers, you end up in a mind share game, right? You are fighting. Um, for mind share. So you're using 
everything your company gives you, plus all your skill set, plus there's some personality stuff in there uh, to get mind share when the people you're calling on have eight or 10 other potential vendor partners who, as you say, as you indicate, may be easier to deal with. Mm -hmm. So I've got a funny anecdote if you want to hear it. Yeah, let's hear your anecdote. We want to hear something. Oh, Steve, years, years ago, I was uh, uh, brought in as an acting VP of channel sales, uh, actually global sales, sorry. And uh, what I had to do was run interference with a CEO who had, um, who was so bad in his personal relationships that he wasn't allowed in the door of any of their major distributors. Uh -huh. So the first, I was on contract there for quite a while, the first five, six months, I spent just running interference. I was actually the curtain, like the Wizard of Oz. You know, don't pay no attention to that man behind the curtain. I was the curtain. I was just trying to keep him away from the uh, the distributors and partners. It was sort of a funny thing. Yeah, it's a funny thing, uh, but there's a serious point in there, which is relationships. Executive level relationships can can make or break a partnership. So you can have the best channel marketing program on earth and lovely sales tools and trainings, but if you've got a disconnect at the executive level or even manager level, you know all bets are off. So that, that's a that's a great story. Just a quick comment: we have Christian Lane here. Uh, Posted a little comment. This is to you, Steve. It says, we miss you in the Atlassian channel, Steve Cross. Your experience and understanding of how the partners make money was always important and critical to our mutual success. Uh, hey, Christian, thanks for joining today. And yeah, I, I share your acknowledgement of Steve here. Oh, goodness. That's so kind. Thanks, Christian. Thanks, Sridhar. Yeah, and let's talk more about making money. So, you know, how do partners ultimately make money. I know we covered a little bit earlier. You want to double click on there, Steve, and talk more about how they make money and the life of the channel rep again? They manage their bench. Uh, they have to manage their bench. Um, it's something that uh, they meet about constantly. They talk about it constantly. Uh, if, if indeed their uh, primary revenue stream is services, then what's key is how much of their time, the time of the consultants is billable. And that's really the, the key, the key metric that they manage to. Hmm. So they, uh, they tend to, Motivation. yeah, they tend to staff to a level that they can keep employed. Mm -hmm. And if uh, your programs take away their potential to em employ that staff, and to keep that staff busy, that's bad. That's uh, that's uh, counterproductive to their business model. That's a good point. Also, just you, you sparked another thought there, Steve, with regards to how they make money. Sometimes we as channel marketers think about things like SPIFs, special incentives. I forget what SPIF stands for. It's an acronym for something back in the 80s, I think. But special monetary incentives. Do they really work? And if not, why not? If they do work, what's, what kind of amount actually drives behavior? What do you think? Well, I've paid a lot of spiffs in the past, and I haven't done that in years. First mm -hmm. of all, a lot of your partners don't want you to pay spiffs. When you mm -hmm. talk to CEOs of, of good-sized partner organizations, they really want to direct their folks. They want to direct the activities of their folks. They want them doing um, they want them doing work that's in keeping with the business model and that's moving the business model forward rather than um, picking uh, low-hanging fruit from whichever vendor happens to come in that month. Yeah. Yeah, Steve, you know what your comment to me sounds a lot like I sometimes hear CEOs, uh, no disrespect from, uh, from them, about them, but sometimes they look at the channel as this as this pay, uh, kind of pay-to-play, uh, coin-operated machine that if you throw some money at it, they're going to automatically do what you want and move your product. I, I know that sounds very um, disrespectful, but uh, believe me, I talk to CEOs who have that attitude that the channel is there to serve them. Uh, and what you're describing is they're not, they have choices, you know, part, channel partners, are in their own business. So can you talk a little bit about, if you were to talk to a CEO, what would you want them to understand about how to work with the channel? Um, well, 
spiffs work at the retail level. So if you're selling a retail product, yeah, that makes total sense. But by the time you get to enterprise software, good gosh, you're not talking to used car salesmen. You're talking to people who have, men and women, who have staked their career on being good at what they do. They actually, whether or not they have the technical chops that the vendor might want, they certainly have the sales chops and the executive sales chops. So it's not, um, it's not coin op. It's, uh, it's knowledge based and experience based. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and it's not coin op. It's what you said earlier, Steve, I believe fighting for mind share. If you're a technology vendor, technology provider, and you're counting on channel partners, they, um, you have to fight for their mind share, make it worth their while, right? And that is, well, that there's some humility involved in that. Go ahead, Steve. Yeah. It, excuse me. It becomes less of a, a fight if you've done a good job of listening and understanding going in. Because every one of these folks that you meet with individually, uh, the CEOs of the, uh, of the channel partners, came up a different way. They may have been hired to run a company that already existed. They may be a founder. They may be a founder and CEO. I know um, some of these folks that um, literally have never had a uh, job as an employee. They came out of university or college and immediately opened their own shop. They've never had a boss that tells them no. And I think uh, a CEO or a an executive needs to listen to those folks and understand them. Yeah, listening. I want to come back to that comment. That's a really important comment principle is listening to your partners and asking about their business. Cody has a great question, by the way. Cody Wooten on the line here um, asks, so what would you say, Steve, are the most vital aspects in breaking down those barriers of entry with partners? And what can make you, you, the partner, they always turn to because of, now the ease of use, easy, easy to use, easy to do business with. You know, what are some of the things we could break down? Um, God, this is going to sound so corny, but um, but I, I believe, at least for me, it's the truth. You got to be honest. You just have to be honest with these folks, what they can expect out of your program, what they can expect out of your company. And then they aren't looking to be sold. They're looking to to be true partners with their vendors. And um, I mean, it really does sound sort of cornball, doesn't it? But you just have to be honest with them. You know, maybe you've got the best widget in the whole wide world and it's also the cheapest and it never fails and all that, but the odds are you don't. The odds are you've got a bag and inside that bag, you've got some products. Some are better than others. Some might even be world class. And you need to be honest about that, what you've got in your bag and what they can expect in dealing with your company. Yeah, honesty goes a long way. I, I really echo that sentiment. And also, Cody, again, thank you for asking your question there. I might add, uh, if you look at some of the barriers, if you will, uh, versus other making it easy to do business. So we talked about training. How do you make training a lower investment to make it easy to consume? Um, also materials, if that channel seller, you need them to want to sell your product, how do you not throw a ton of content and assets? You know, we like to do channel sales playbooks, for example, Steve, I'm gonna ask you about that in just a moment. Sometimes it can be a barrier if you're expecting your channel partner to wade through a 20 page channel sales playbook when an alternative vendor may have you know, a one pager that's just super easy to read, e- easy to consume, easy to send to their prospect. So I think there are barriers that we vendor on the vendor side, maybe self-inflicting wounds. <laughs> you know, just put yourself in the shoes of that channel rep. So coming back to channel sales playbooks or some of these assets that we marketers love to create, what are your thoughts on you know, how do we make those more consumable and easy to, to, to put to work? Well, there are two philosophies here. The one philosophy is less is more, and the other philosophy is more is more. And I I see more is more a lot. And that's those 20-page sales playbooks. First of all, know your audience. That's in any talk, in any uh, meeting, know your audience. Know what what they're looking for. And maybe a two-page FAQ is more than adequate. You know what? (laughs) If you're talking to folks, 
I mean, I know enterprise sales folks that work in partners that have 20 years of experience. They do not need a 20 page uh, you know, sales book, uh, a sales playbook. They need, you know, five bullet points. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they know the whole rest of it. They know how it fits in to mm -hmm. their customers. They've got relationships with customers that have generated literally millions of dollars. So I just, I just think that when anyone on the sales or marketing, marketing side tries to overwhelm, the, overwhelm them with a ton of content, mm -hmm. I think that's ineffective. Yeah. And see, I know you taught me years ago, earlier in my career, that ask them, ask the partner, ask the channel partner, what is it they value the most? Uh, they may not want a playbook or a FAQ or whatever tool you might have. They may want, sometimes I've heard them ask, just give me the money and trust that we're going to spend to drive your product, uh, support us when we need. So, uh, so I want to give a nod to Christian again, Christian Lane. Thank you, Christian. He's the CEO of one of the top Atlassian partners. A wonderful organization, Christian, that you run and have founded. So thanks. Christian says, agreed with regards to the SPIF. He says, as consultants, it's critically important we solve problems. Often, any SPIF isn't cognizant of the need of the client at the time. Some things that Christian's saying here are really worth listening to. Um, a lot of these partners are solving problems. And of course, the vendor technology provider is solving a problem, but the partner is you know, the, the front line in front of that customer solving a real need. And a spiff is sort of out of sync with that philosophy. What are your thoughts about this idea of solving problems in partnerships there, Steve? Well, Christian is CEO and founder of uh, a consulting company called Precipio, mm -hmm. one of Atlassian's top partners, a platinum partner. And that's all they do is solve problems. They solve problems on behalf of the client. And maybe that's part of digital transformation. Maybe it's part of... Uh, uh, bringing a uh, engineering team into uh, an agile environment and schooling them and teaching them and training them and putting in the underlying um, uh, software tools they're going to need to be agile. But it's all about solving problems. And if, uh, if the sales rep walks through the door offering 500 bucks for this product and $750 to sell that product, it's not at all in keeping with what Kristen wants for his sales team to be doing. Very true. I want to pause here and ask uh, the audience, feel free to post questions in the little chat box on the right here, or if you're on Facebook or Twitter, you can always post a comment there and we'll absolutely uh, ask Steve, our expert here on channel sales. Um, Steve, also I've heard about, by the way, just real quick comment on channel sales playbook. Full disclosure, we have a lot of clients for which we have done these big books, the 20 pagers, but the reason, the way they use them it's back to Christian's comments about problem solving. In the books, we talk about all these different use cases or scenarios with the customer, end customer has certain challenges and problems. And we you know, descri describe the problem statement, the solution the partner offers, kind of results they should expect to get. Again, goes back to your comment about honesty. So there is a place for the larger books, but typically it is a reference guide for the account manager, the channel account manager, more than that end seller. Uh, so there is a place for those things. But yeah, I want to come back to um, advisory councils, uh, Steve. I know you've done oh. Atlassian, very successful. Yeah. You've run wonderful advisory uh, meetings with your top uh, ecosystem partners. Can you talk about what is what's, what are some of the best practices in running a partner advisory board? Oh, great. Uh, thank you. Uh, well, it's changed. It's changed uh, dramatically through the pandemic. There, you, there used to be a time where you'd take your partner advisory council and fly them to some exotic location. You'd take the cream of the crop, your top sellers, right? And uh, and what you'd get back, the feedback you'd get back is what you would expect from your top sellers, right? They've figured it out. They know how to work within your structure, within your ecosystem. They just know how to do it and they know how to do it and do it well. But nowadays with Zoom or Blue Jeans or whatever you want to use or Google Meet, um, you can have a partner advisory council that is manageable but diverse. Mm -hmm. uh, partners of all sizes, partners of all geos, and um, I think that gives you a more uh, 
honest environment to uh, solicit feedback and um, make proposals to. Mm -hmm. So let's talk, let's double click on this partner advisory board. So we live in you know, pandemic times, so everything's virtual, virtually virtual. And um, what would an agenda look like? So I imagine, Steve, is this just a few hours in, in one day? Is it, you know, what, what would be an agenda or some of the objectives of a partner advisory board uh, session? And by the way, how many participants are we talking about? Are we talking about two or three or a dozen? Or I, I, know I, I, go, for, I go for bigger rather than smaller. Because again, if you self if you select or self select a smaller group, you are going to get uh, limited uh, input. Whereas if you have a, a bigger group, um, your input is because they're more diverse. The input that you receive is more diverse, so you become more aware of how your programs and your stance actually affect your partners. Mm -hmm. So when you say diverse, would you go so far as saying, okay, Christian Lane, I mean, would you invite his direct competitors to a partner advisory Absolutely. board? Or would you, would you not? Absolutely. Absolutely. And here's why. They talk to each other anyhow. Oh. The, the, the myth that um, partners who compete with each other don't talk, that really is a myth. They all talk. They all probably They probably have a private Slack channel for all the partners that the vendor doesn't even know about. So, uh, yeah, they, they all talk to each other. That's why, if I may, you never come to a partner advisory council with a done deal. Meaning done deal like what? Like a fait accompli, like a program you're rolling out that's never been seen by a partner, that's never had any comments by a partner, and yet you're rolling it out to all of your key partners <laughs> It's um, it's not disingenuous. It's disrespectful. That's a great point. So I think your comment there is there is a difference between a partner advisory board where you don't want to be using that to surprise your partners and try to launch something there, but you do want to use as a back channel as an input session. Like, hey, here's something we're looking to launch. We have a lot of security clients, as you know, Steve. Many enterprise security clients of ours count on the channel. And I sad to say, some of them I have seen do exactly what you say not to do. They'll go to a partner advisory summit and they'll, the marketer side, channel marketing side, well intended, will sometimes use that to launch some cool new program without having consulted with a small handful of maybe competing you know, firms, let's say. For, to your point, what seems to work better is to consult with a few. Now, so that's one objective you're saying is, is feedback session. What other objectives are there in that partner advisory? Sorry, Steve, you're about to say something else. Um, yeah, I was, I was going to say that if you do one of those to your partner advisory council and you present them something that you're rolling out without ever talking to anybody, you can bet that every single partner that talks to those partners will know about it and will feel bad about it. Oh, wow. That's a great yeah. comment. Okay. Any other do's and don'ts on partner advisory board meetings? Oh, I, I love role plays. I love scripted or unscripted um, role plays. So even among competing partners, what would you say to a customer if you were in this, if we were going to do this and you were talking to the uh, uh, VP of engineering about that, how would you address that? And even have them competing partners form up into small groups and decide how they would present that. So you get a um, sort of a boiled down uh, overall view of how your best partners would actually do things. I think it's very impressive. I led one of those in um, in Sydney for Atlassian that I think um, I I. I hope the partners were as delighted by it as I was, but it, it was absolutely a delight and told us so much about what we needed to do in terms of content, in terms of web presence. It, it just told us so much about it. That's good, Steve. We're gonna be wrapping up our conversation here shortly. Again, I invite uh, folks in the audience to thank you so much for attending. If you have any questions, feel free. You know, Stephen, in your, you've had a long, illustrious career. You're still consulting to the top Atlassian ecosystem partners, um, very much still in demand, Steve, so-called retired, but you know, we all know, wink, wink. 
uh, that people still count on your advice. So when you look at channel marketing programs in your entire career, what stands out as, man, that was an outstanding program, really well conceived, very well you know, bought in by the partners, extremely well executed, awesome results. You know, reflect on your overall career, maybe not just Atlassian, Connect, Eric Smith, Micro, and others. Anything, uh, I know I'm putting you on the spot here, stand out as something memorable that a program manager did? While you're thinking what, about stands out, what stands out to me is all of the various top quality lead gen programs. Uh, what was, what's been the most, yeah, what stands out the most is some of the lead gen programs, especially because there's a tendency to generate leads and the vendor thinks, well, these are our leads. Well, yeah, they are, they belong to you. But if you've got a direct sales force and a channel sales force, don't give both sides the same leads. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's a disincentive to everybody. Uh, if it's a channel lead program, keep it in the channel. And the, the ones that I've seen that are really so effective and generate such terrific results are done that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I wanna echo that sentiment about um, driving leads for and with the partner and having them it's sort of like priming the pump. Uh, the more leads you can bring to the partner, then the more they're gonna to wanna to spend time. It goes back to Cody's comment about um, what are some of the barriers? Well, look, if you can throw some leads their way and through opportunity registration, they own those leads and you do not have permission ethically or literally to give the lead to another competing partner or, or even take it in-house, which is even worse, right? But if you can prime the pump, I'm using the word prime the pump, but throw leads through a nice campaign. I've seen that work extremely effectively and where it works effectively is there's some double comp going on, Steve. What do you think about that? Where the partner gets money for the lead, you know, to, to develop the lead, close the lead, and then the channel account manager is also somehow incentivized to drive leads to and with partners. I had, I had never seen that until I worked for Silicon Graphics. I managed the seven southeastern states when uh, uh, Silicon for channels, when the uh, Silicon Graphics was on an upswing from a billion to two billion. And uh, um, they did not care about double compensating. Mm -hmm. They honestly couldn't give a you know what about double compensating. And what it generated was avid partners. It generated enthusiastic sales reps. Um, the President's Club trip um, to uh, the south of France, maybe 92-ish, I think, mm -hmm. was just jubilant. We were all making money and our partners were all making money. Mm -hmm. Everybody, and it was just even handed and fair um, and everybody was excited. So nice. Yeah, nice. That, was, that was really a great experience. Okay, well, there you go. There you have it here. So um, any more questions from the audience here? I'm not seeing any of the chat sessions. We're gonna start wrapping up here. Um, I guess the final thought is, I'm thinking of a company with regards to memorable programs, channel programs. So one client of ours, former client is uh, Cloud Physics, uh, early stage company, and they were brilliant. One of the things they did, Steve, is exactly what you're describing. They actually drove leads into the channel partner, gave them leads, um, provided system engineering, SE support, you know, all the way from leads to closing the deals. They did it uh, for at least a dozen accounts um, in one of the large VARs that they work with. Uh, in a period of literally, I think it's two fiscal quarters, they went from zero certified, trained, and effective channel sellers to 300. Three hundred in a mere, in a period of six months. How did they do that? Well, it's what you're saying. Is first off, they're very honest. They're, they didn't throw programs at them. They worked with the partner on what materials and trainings, enablements, and you know, support would be helpful. Going back to Christian's comment, they're in the problem solving business. This this uh, bar of theirs. So a lot of great practices there. They did need a sales playbook, by the way. The account manager did to get educated. Uh, I didn't mean to diss playbooks, by the way, because a lot of our clients didn't want them. But it has to be in the context of doing business, you know, easy to do business. So final word on your side, uh, Steve, if you were to say one thing you would love channel marketers to start doing more of, just one thing, what, what is your advice? Oh gosh, listen, for that. listen, just listen. That's it. Just, 
Just, <laughs> just listen. If you're not listening, start listening. If you're listening, keep listening. <laughs> yeah, Steve, that ties right back to the whole point of today's conversation. How do you, how do you make channel partnerships work? Starts by listening. Starts and ends by listening, right? Listening, listening throughout the whole process. Yeah, so once again, a huge thank you to Steve for coming here today. Um, Steve, by the way, is an author. He's got a wonderful book on channel sales. Can you remind us the title and where we could find it? Oh, gosh. it's I think it's out of print. It's called Changing Channels. It was used as a textbook for a while, but I wrote it in the, oh, my goodness, the 90s. I've been doing this stuff a long time. I'm old. Yeah, we'll uh, but my latest book is actually called Steve's Cigar Book, and I used to be a big cigar smoker, so. Uh, I'm really good with titles of books. <laughs> Steve so Changing Channels and then the Cigar Book are the two. We'll post them on, on our chat and on our blog post here so you have access to those. Uh, on Changing Channels, that even though the book is so-called out of print, you can still get them online. You can buy that. Um, and I will tell you, it has a lot of good best practices that are especially valid today. It has to do with listening, has to do with building sort of relationships and not trying to treat partners as uh, machines that that clearly are not. So that's a great book. I highly endorse it. We also have some blog posts that we'll make available to you guys on channel sales and how to make partnerships really, really hum and sing. So once again, Steve, thank you so much. We're glad you're around. You know, stay busy. Um, we know where to find you. We'll post your contact info up on the on the blog as well. So Thanks. wish everyone a fantastic rest of your week. Thank you, sir. We'll yes, see you again. You. Thanks for inviting me. This has just been an absolute pleasure. Much appreciated. This is this is a delight. Made my day. Ours too. And many others.